Welcome back to season four of Pathways by Grenadian Steam, the podcast where we chat with West Indian professionals at home and in the diaspora who have worked in one or more of the fields of science, technology, engineering, architecture, or mathematics to understand what led them to choose the path they did, the successes, failures, and learnings they've had along the way, and in general, what careers are out there. This season, in addition to debuting full video episodes on YouTube and Spotify to help you feel more engaged, we will be including our members, both students and professionals, in the conversations, inviting them to share their own thoughts, ideas, and experiences on the topics brought up by our guests. This is in an effort to encourage and normalize discussions among people of all ages and levels within society. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed the journey on today's pathway. My guest for today is Dr. Weslyn Ashton, who is an associate professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology with joint appointments at the Stewart School of Business and the Institute of Design. She holds a faculty affiliate courtesy appointment in the Armour College of Engineering, Department of Civil, Architectural and Environmental Engineering. Dr. Ashton is a sustainable system scientist whose research, teaching, and practice are oriented around transitioning our socio-ecological systems towards sustainability and equity. She studies the adoption of socially and environmentally responsible strategies in business and the role of innovation and entrepreneurship in addressing social and environmental changes. Her research is grounded in industrial ecology and the circular economy. Her current work focuses on increasing sustainability and equity in urban food systems and developing regenerative economies in post-industrial regions, newly industrializing countries, and small island states. She was awarded a Jefferson Science Fellowship by the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in 2018. She spent the 2018 to 2019 academic year as a science policy advisor at the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, where she worked with the Bureau for Europe and Eurasia on strategic planning, energy policy, and energy efficiency programs in the Balkans and Ukraine. Dr. Ashton, welcome to Pathways. Hi, Arlene. Thank you so much for having me. Thank it's a pleasure you. to be here. That was a lot of big words and a lot of interesting stuff in your bio. <laughs> so I can't wait to get into some of it. Sure. All right. So I feel like I need to give a little bit of a backstory here because I don't always know the guests that I have on here. But and sometimes I do have a history, but not all. And you, I do know. So we actually met at university um, in Illinois where you teach at IIT. And you never actually taught me, but we met because you were one of the, I think, the only Caribbean faculty member at the school. And um, you also happen to be the advisor, of course, of our student association, Caribbean Visionaries, which I then became very involved with. Um, and I think it was just like, you know, the, the tight knit nature of that group and how it all started that we were able to develop a, a pretty strong rapport. Um, not just me and you, but you with all the Caribbean students where you would be at your house for Thanksgiving every year and so on. So, yeah. And, time. <laughs> and um, you are actually, I think, the first Trini that I have on here. So welcome. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, but so enough of, of that history and, and nostalgia, but I think I, I'm actually a little ashamed of myself because in preparing for this and reading your bio and so on, I kind of just realized that through my time at IIT, I, I just saw you as like a business professor. <laughs> That's all I knew. You taught in the business school. <laughs> and I know that you worked in sustainability and so on. But, <clears throat> but if anybody had asked me, you know, what it is that you do, I would have said, oh, she's in business or business and design. So um, I want to use that to kind of segue into not just all the, the great things that we talked to us in your bio there, but understand how you got to that point sure. in, in your work and in your career. Um, and so to get to all that, I'm going to start off by asking you a quick five questions, give the listeners an overview of who you are. And from there, we'll go ahead and connect some of the dots. Yeah. All right. So where specifically did you grow up? 
I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, as you alluded to, but my dad is from St. Vincent. And so growing up, we spent a fair bit of time uh, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but most of the time in Trinidad. Okay. Interesting. And can you list for us every school that you attended from childhood up to this point? (laughs) In order, please. (laughs) Yeah, my first preschool uh, was called Miss Olga's, and she was just a, a lady who lived a couple of streets away, and I would go there half day, <laughs> you yeah. know, when I was like two, three, probably four years old. I then moved to the States briefly and attended kindergarten in the U.S., and I cannot remember the name of my elementary school. Yeah, I was there briefly, so really just for kindergarten. Moved back to Trinidad. Um, and attended the Aranguas Islamia school um, because I think I came back during the middle of the the school year. And so that was the only school that had a spot (laughs) available. From there, I went to El Socorro Government Primary. I spent two years there uh, and then moved to Sacred Heart Girls Roman Catholic um, primary school and spend the, the rest of my, my primary time there. So that was probably about three, about three years, maybe. From there, I did my, what was then called the common entrance in Trinidad. It's now the, the SDA uh, and went to Bishop Anstey High School you know, in Port of Spain and was at Bishops from first form through sixth form. But at the time, and I also feel like I'm saying at the time, it makes me sound old, but at the time, none of the girls' high schools offered further pure math and computing as part of the the A-level curriculum. And so I split my time between Bishops and Fatima College, which was a a boys' school where I did computing. And, and I think that that's interesting, you know, the, the splitting time. From Bishops and Fatima, after my A-levels, I went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, where I majored in environmental engineering with a minor in political science. And then did my PhD, master's and PhD at Yale University in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, now called the School of Environment. And so I did both master's and my doctorate there at Yale. Got it. That's plenty. (laughs) Yeah, that's a long list. I'm trying to keep track. (laughs) Is that it now? (laughs) Done? It is. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay, so thinking back to your primary and secondary school days, describe yourself for us as a a young student. I think from very early, I was very quiet and bookish, right? Like, love to read. Mm -hmm. I was also very curious. Um, And and I would say quirky. Like, there are things that, you know, like other people just found weird of it that I might do, like hugging trees. (laughs) <laughs> literally <laughs> I'm starting to put the dots together now okay. <laughs> um, and then I think you know in secondary school I had a bit of a rebellious phase right because I was, uh, was very bright and didn't have to to study a whole lot and that got me into some trouble which I'm sure we'll get into uh, um, okay. um, in our conversation mm-hmm. okay interesting so all right, before we dive into some of that, what was your first job ever in life? At Fatima College, we had an after school. And it's all right. So this is where I'm going to age myself. Yeah. Uh, so this is the early 1990s. You know, everybody was starting to get into computers and computer science. And so we held training courses at our computer lab for adults to learn kind of basic like the Microsoft Office packages, so Excel, Word. I don't I don't think there was PowerPoint back in those days. <laughs> I <think so. laughs> but I know we, we had WordPerfect. There were like a couple of packages, some database packages. 
And so we, I was an instructor and, and sort of like a teaching assistant um, okay. in, in those programs. You also had a summer camp. And so, you know, it, it's funny, right? So I was teaching. Yeah. And this was, this was in Fatima College, so high school. Yeah. Secondary yeah. school. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And your current job or profession, if you had to put it all in a nutshell, what do you do right now? Yeah, I am a professor, so I have responsibility for teaching, mainly at the graduate level at Illinois Tech uh, and research. Uh, so as we you said in the bio, much of my research is at the intersection of business, environment, and design. Right? I'm really thinking about how we can change our business practices and systems so that they more in harmony with the environment and being more sustainable. And so it's, you know, kind of ironic, like I, I wouldn't have, have imagined myself, you know, at 16, 17, imagine that I would have been a, a teacher, <laughs> you know, the, these years later, but here I am. <laughs> okay, so let's get into that. Well, first, I actually want to ask you something that you mentioned previously. So you said that you split your time in, in secondary school between the boys and the girls school to get the computing classes. Was that a normal thing that a lot of other girls did or were you kind of the only one? Yeah, it was very unusual. Uh Uh, So in my class at at Fatima, uh, there were two girls. The year above me, there were also two and below, I think there were like two or three. And and, uh, you know, a couple of years later, because there was the demand, uh, the girls' schools started having those facilities, but at the time it was just kind of like a handful. You know, so, so I did um, computer science. Like I, you know, also have you know, female friends who went to do like further pure math at some of the other boys' schools. So, so there were just kind of these these handful of, of girls who were allowed in to to do the kind of hardcore science uh, classes that were only offered at the boys' schools at those times. I'm, I'm guessing you needed to have pretty good grades to get in to something like yeah. that. Yeah, okay. um, right. And so we had to be able to demonstrate, to, um, right, so straight A's, ones, and whatever those classes, as well as go through a, a screen with the the teachers to kind of be accepted into the program and I you know remember the computer science teacher at Fatima she was this really amazing feisty you know little black woman who had done computer science at uh, RPI at uh, Rensselaer Rensselaer. uh, Uh Technic Institute and you know, it was just like, I don't want any girls coming in here to mess up my, my thing, but would always let in a couple. And yeah. so you had to kind of like, you know, you know, she'd look at the, your grades and kind of look to see kind of like why you were interested in, mm-hmm. in doing this to be, to be let into, <laughs> in, into their special <laughs> program. Holy grail. And yeah. so what, what led you to even want to get into that program? Was that your decision or your parents or how did it come about? Was it just something you did because you were good at, at school? So this is interesting. I think it was it was mainly my own decision. Um, okay. My parents really didn't push me. Like I said, I was I was sort of the, the strange child who liked to read all the time, right? Mm-hmm. And they just were like, all right, if that's what you want to do, <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead. And... And, and I think, you know, like when we got to the point of A-levels and, and I had to choose what subjects that I wanted to do, um, you know, I did math and physics. And, and then maybe it was like a combination of, of like what was offered and kind of the timing of, of what was offered. I didn't want to do, maybe it was chemistry. <laughs> okay. um, and I was like, well, you know, maybe I do computer science instead. Yeah. And that would give me, you know, more options. And, and so I kind of pursued the opportunity and um, heard through some friends who had gone to, 
to Fatima to, to do the computer science and just explore that there. Okay, interesting. All right, so at this point, you were saying that you, you never would have seen yourself as a teacher. So what was in the back of your mind as to what you wanted to do, what you wanted to get out, out of all of this? Was it just pursuing subjects you liked or was there a goal in mind? So I'm the type of person, I would say, who never had a singular goal in mind, right? Okay. I kind of did, um, and even the, the subjects that I did in school, right? It was the sciences. And I did the sciences because I thought that's what smart kids had to do. Uh, right. right. That, that's what we were expected to do. Yep. And so I, I, I didn't have a plan. I remember, you know, kind of in form three, when we were deciding subjects, I was really heartbroken that I think it was geography and chemistry were offered kind of like in the same spot. And I had to choose between the two and I chose chemistry because I thought, you know, uh, that's more science oriented. That's what I wanted to do, but I loved geography. Yeah. And, and so it is ironic, right. That I end up in environmental science and the work that I'm doing has both social, environmental, physical dimensions. And so, so it is, you know, both a physical and human geography in a way that I've right. come back to in my work. So I would say that, you know, like I didn't have um, a plan. I know that, that I liked science. I liked computer science and so I, I did it really with an open mind to see where it might take me. Okay. So then you, I think you said you basically went straight to, was it MIT after sixth form? Or was there a break in between? Yeah. So I did not. No. Um, so okay. let, let's get, get into why not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I mentioned to you that, you know, part of my, my journey, um, in high school, I started rebelling against, you know, the, oh, smart girls do science, and this is what I'm going to do because it's expected of me. And I, you know, stopped studying, was hanging out, partying a lot. Yeah. And so when I did my A-levels, you know, thought I had studied enough and Yes, was, was having a good time, was lots of partying, had carnival, <laughs> played <laughs> <Everything>. myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then results came out and I got an A in computer science, okay. a B in math, B in general paper, and a C in physics. Mm. And I was devastated <laughs> yeah. because never in my life you know, had I ever gotten anything less than like an A minus. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and so this was like a really important pivotal moment for me because I knew that my parents, um, you know, couldn't afford to send me to university. And so if I was going to college, I needed to get a scholarship. Uh, and one of my math tutors at the time, you know, sat me down, we had a, a, like a long conversation about, you know, kind of where I was going, what I wanted to do, and what was the pathway to get there, right? And, and so for me, I knew like, if I wanted to, you know, kind of not, not follow the, the path of most of the girls in my neighborhood, you know, which was really finishing high school at 16, 17, you know, getting some kind of retail or bank job, you know, getting married and pregnant soon thereafter. And I was just not, you know, I didn't see that for myself. And so I knew if I wanted something different that I would have to go to university you know, and likely university outside of Trinidad and the Caribbean. And the only way that I would get there was if I had a scholarship. Right. And so I, you know, kind of put my head down for the next nine months and repeated upper six and my A-levels so that I could get uh, a scholarship. And so in the end, I, I got an open national scholarship from Trinidad and Tobago, which nice. allowed me to go to school anywhere in the world that I wanted to. And, 
And so I went to, to MIT on that scholarship and it was completely um, paid for by the, the government. But, you know, that that failure was really important uh, mm-hmm. for me to kind of take stock and, you know, stop just right. It's just honestly, I didn't study at all, you know. Taking like it for granted that did AIDS, you would do well. But, right. But, I, you know, I was coasting. Right. Um, as opposed to, you know, like really um, being a lot more serious. And so I think that that failure helped me to recognize uh, the amount of work that would be needed to, to up my game, right, to, to go to that higher level. Okay. Interesting story. Enjoy a stay at True Blue Bay Boutique Resort, a family-run eco-friendly waterfront resort in the beautiful island of Grenada. Choose between tropical rooms, suites, or villas, and enjoy complimentary breakfast, access to four pools, guided water sport activities, as well as the option for spa treatments, yoga classes, diving, and snorkeling trips. Relax by one of the pools and get drinks served to you from the poolside bar, or go adventuring the coastline on our kayaks, finding turtles, eagle rays, or even lobsters. Perfect for families, couples, and single travelers, True Blue Bay Resort has something for everyone. Email reservations at truebluebay.com for bookings and inquiries. Why MIT? And what did what did you choose to study at MIT and why? I, I could have gone anywhere in the world. And it, it just so happened that uh, we had a pipeline to, to MIT. Oh, okay. I... Probably had, by the time I, I got there, maybe like five friends who, who were already there. And, and I don't recall kind of how this had started, but, you know, like somebody went, <laughs> you know, got a scholarship and told their friends and <laughs> they told their friends there you know, and how it goes. Right. And so by the time that I got there, we had this amazing Caribbean club. Nice. Right. And with kids from Trinidad, uh, Jamaica, Barbados, and then, you know, the other smattering from the other islands as well. And I knew that if I went to UE, I would be on a particular path, right? So because I had done math and computer science, um, like that, that would be the place that um, I'd be prepared to go into. And I wanted the flexibility of the U.S. education system to be able to kind of just tap into what I was passionate about, right? Because I think, you know, like at that reflection point when I, you know, didn't do well in A's, um, I really thought about, well, what what is the thing that I'm passionate about and, and that I want to do? And I kind of saw, okay, I can go into computer science. You know, I could maybe go into medicine um, or I could go back into environmental science, geography. And I'm like, I think that's where my passion is, right? Like I care about pollution and kind of like being from Trinidad as the most industrialized of the Caribbean islands with lots of oil pollution (laughs) and air pollution. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You're seeing it firsthand. Right? Like, yeah, yeah, like we need to be doing something differently. And and so I kind of had that in, in my head that that's where I'd want to go. And so I needed to be in a place where I could potentially explore all of those options and then use that to to guide my decision. So I got to MIT. In the first year, you do not have to declare a major. Uh, And so you just take kind of whatever classes are interesting to you. And so I took a bunch of computer science classes. I took some environmental science classes. And we had an amazing department chair in environmental engineering. His name was Rafael Brass. He was Puerto Rican. And he, you know, later went on after MIT to be the provost at Georgia Tech. But Professor Brass... And I think partly because he's Puerto Rican, um, but was like very interested in diversity, right? And like creating uh, a program that was very welcoming to to women, to people of color. 
And so you, you look at our cohort in civil and environmental engineering compared to any of the other engineering departments, uh, we were heavily female, uh, very diverse, and it was just, you know, like such a good atmosphere. And, and so I, I feel that there's a combination of like, yes, this is what I want to do, but then it's also being in a place where I feel welcomed and that my contributions are going to be valued right. um, and, and that I'm being seen for, you know, for, for being someone of value in, in this space. So at the end of the first year, I declared environmental engineering as my major and then you know, continued, continued from there. All right. So MIT, then Yale, where you eventually completed your PhD. Selecting, selecting your thesis or selecting what you are going to research for years and years. Once you got into environmental program, realized that this is what you were interested in. How did you then decide what to go with, what you wanted to really dive into? So between MIT and Yale, I worked as an environmental engineer for for about a year, and that was, you know, doing lots of calculations, figuring out uh, different types of pollutants, their fate in the environment, like mainly to assess harm and attribute liabilities, right? So this company had this operation in X and Y year, uh, they had some spill of chemical contaminants into the environment. Where did it end up? Did it pollute some water body that people were using to drink water? So what is the liability that can be charged to that chemical manufacturer? Um, okay. and, and assessing kind of like what is the risk uh, that both humans and other species were exposed to because of uh, that contaminant in the environment. So I did that for about a year. And, you know, in, in my head, as a part of the scholarship from, from Trinidad, we are expected to return to work for a number of years for the government. Right. And so I was like, oh, I've you know been doing this cool stuff. Uh, let me go to Trinidad and see if I can find a job and do something like this and make a contribution there. So I went back to Trinidad and knocked on many doors <laughs> <laughs> and found you know people were interested in, in in talking to me, but there were not positions available. And at the the time, some of my my friends from MIT were just starting a business. So, so you know, back in, in sort of circa 2000, we, so because I wasn't getting a job doing what I wanted to do, I decided to work with them. And we established um, a very large internet cafe and web services um, facility. And, and at the time, I was like, we were like the largest internet cafe in, in the Caribbean. But as a part of kind of being the, the manager of this enterprise, you know, like I also introduced virtual office services, co that we now call them co working spaces, oh, okay. right? <laughs> Pioneer, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and ended up working kind of like back in a computer science um, mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. for about another year. And it was, you know, like a, a good experience to be back in the Caribbean working, but it kind of wasn't in the area that I wanted to be in. Right. Uh, and I knew I wanted to go to graduate school um, because I felt that um, adding on our graduate degree would enable me to advance in my career. And, you know, in, in these couple of years between the bachelor's and, and graduate school, I'd done a couple of different things. And so I felt like that was good exposure and it was a good time to think about going back. Just for reference, yeah. how much time was it between the two degrees? So it was about two like two and change two years okay. and change yeah. 
in in my last one of my last classes at, at MIT, mm-hmm. I was exposed to the idea of industrial ecology, and so, so this is where I ended up. But the core premise of industrial ecology is that our industrial system, our economic system, has a lot that we can learn from nature. And if we can pattern our industries after the organization of ecosystems, then they can operate more efficiently and kind of be more in harmony with nature. And I just loved this idea. And, you know, kind of being back in Trinidad, and I'm like, yeah, that's definitely what I want to think about. How can we, as people on a small island, create our industrial footprint that matches the place where we are, right? And Mm. we're not um, extracting, importing resources so much um, that overwhelms the ability of the island ecosystem to accommodate those wastes, right? And whether that, that's air pollution, water pollution, or solid waste um, coming in. And so I looked around um, on the web at, at programs for industrial ecology. And in the, the US at the time, uh, there was a strong program at Michigan and at Yale. And so I applied to, to both. Right. I think I also applied to University of California at Berkeley. Uh-huh. Um, but that was a more traditional environmental engineering um, program and got into both and had a conversation with one of the professors at Yale and who was working on on the topic. It's called industrial symbiosis or eco-industrial development. And I was like, yes, that's it. We need to be building eco-industrial parks in the Caribbean. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And and so she and I, you know, had some fantastic conversations. So both over email and then over the phone. And I I, um, went to visit and I was like, yeah, this um, seems like it would be a a great place. And, and, And so I'm seeing... Something here in our conversation, Arlene, yes. that it's kind of like interest in a topic, but it's also about the people yes. that you're working with, you mm-hmm. know, being very important for kind of, at, at least for me, kind of like where I you know, ended up on my path, right? And, and so I think, you know, like when we are looking for opportunities, whether that is for our studies or for work opportunities, that being in a community with people who are going to support and look out for you, you know, is really, you know, really important. important. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot more twists and turns, I think, in this story than I was expecting, but it's, it's good because it helps <laughs> to build out the story even better. All right. So then you, so I'm guessing this became your advisor, this yes. woman you had spoken yes. to. Yeah. Okay. And so right now with your, your focus on, you know, heavily emerging economies and um, small island states and so on. And also just food systems. Which I guess I'm. I and we need some more connection between what you what you went into there in your PhD and kind of how that propelled you. Sure. So the the professor at Yale that I ended up working with, her name is Marianne Trito. Okay. And, and she had just gotten funding to begin a project in Puerto Rico. Oh. And so that was like oh, one of the things that we connect, connected on. I, I was coming from Trinidad and she had this project that was about to start in Puerto Rico. And I was like, well, clearly <laughs> <laughs> this was meant to be. <laughs> uh, so, so the project was called Puerto Rico, an Island of Sustainability. Oh. And I ended up doing my PhD work on the pharmaceutical industry in Puerto Rico. Um, and in the Beginning in the 50s and 60s, so, so this is this is an imp- important Caribbean point. So Sir so Arthur Lewis, mm-hmm. uh, St. Lucian, actually lived in Puerto Rico. He worked at the University of Puerto Rico and was an important advisor to the Puerto Rican government. 
And Sir Arthur Lewis is one of his economic models was called you know, development by invitation. So the idea was small economies, developing economies uh, could get foreign exchange uh, money to develop by inviting foreign capital, foreign manufacturing businesses uh, to locate um, in those locations. You give them some tax incentives, but then they're going to build the local economy, right? They're going to need materials, labor from the local market, and that's going to help build up the, the local economy. Okay. So Puerto Rico kind of like wholeheartedly embraced this economic development by invitation model. And the main industry that came was pharmaceuticals. Interesting. One of the reasons that, that they came has to do, and the particular location in Puerto Rico where they're clustered, has to do with the very high quality and abundant uh, groundwater aquifers um, in that region, right? So if you think about pharmaceutical manufacturing, there's a very high level of purity that's needed for products, right? And, and actually, you know, when, when we think about it, the pharmaceutical industry is actually one of the most highly wasteful industries because of that level of purity that is required for the products. Got it. So, so we went into Puerto Rico kind of like trying to understand the industrial landscape, kind of what industries are there, um, who's working together with whom, why are they working together, uh, and what are the environmental benefits that are being accrued through their collaboration. Okay. So I kind of zoned in on this cluster pharmaceutical industry. So there was 12, 15 companies and kind of like a, I want to say like a 15, 20 mile stretch, right? Okay. So, so a relatively confined area who were extracting heavily from this aquifer, right? And that was the, the reason. One were, single aquifer. So, so, I mean, so it's a very large aquifer in the body, but, but yes, mm-hmm. essentially. And they've been operating since the 1960s, um, So on one hand, Lewis's idea and and model uh, is great, right? So the industries come in, the University of Puerto Rico at Mayaguez, which is kind of their engineering campus, um, works closely with the pharmaceuticals and turns out all of these engineers who are going to get jobs there, right? And, And and then, you know, folks are mainly in engineering and then they kind of move up through the ranks and you have the, the management, you know, being um, Puerto Rican and not so much North American a- anymore. Um, okay. And then there's supply chain all over the island. But because of the concentration of the industry, they hold a lot of power. You know? mm-hmm. And the, so the second main reason why they're there is because of tax advantages. And the the tax code is set up in in such a way that any value that you produce on the island is not taxed. And so they developed this elaborate scheme called transfer pricing. So in my global supply chain, I'm going to produce raw materials in Ireland, something else in Singapore, something else in China, but I'm bringing it all to Puerto Rico to have it the final manufacturing in this location because I can put a made in the USA stamp on it and not pay taxes on all of the value that I'm creating on the island. And so there's like a, like a bit of a shell game, right? And so it's like, oh, well, I'm not yeah, getting as much value of the raw materials that are coming from Ireland and really all the values being created here in Puerto Rico. And so this elaborate um, kind of tax setup you know, like the second big reason and probably the more important reason um, why they they were there. But in, in my work, what I tried to do was to understand what collaborations were developing within the industry, between different companies, uh, different sectors, and what were the environmental costs and benefits associated with them. And long story short, there were lots of advantages for for working together. Those benefits did not always 
extend to the communities that they were located next to. And in fact, there were significant costs um, on those communities, such as, as air pollution, right? And, and so there were contentious relations for, for many years. There were lawsuits that were, were helpful to get the corporate partners to behave in a certain way. So regulations are important. But overall, you know, the, the, the picture and kind of like what I studied and emerged was really thinking about how you know, industry evolves in a similar manner to how our ecosystems evolve, right? So, yeah. so there's a period where there's uh, many industries kind of coming together to, to take advantage of the resources that are there. You know, they, they then go through a, a phase of aggregation, or you might think of this as like a mergers and acquisitions phase, right? So it's, it's solidifying. And then there are disruptions, right? And these disruptions can be natural. Uh, so like with hurricanes or natural disasters, they can be economic. So the loss of the tax advantages, like the tax code ended in, I want to say 2006. And so post 2006, the pharmaceutical uh, industry is essentially all left the island. Yeah. Um, and so you, ha- you have these disruptions um, that can cause a reorganization in the industrial fabric and you have new players coming in. Um, but in, in, in all circumstances, we need to think about how industry is drawing upon the natural resources uh, on which they're, they're based, what waste they're putting back into the environment and what are ways to minimize that waste disposal, to kind of be more efficient in our extraction of the resources that we're using in order to operate in harmony, right? And, and, and so there, they were, they were not operating in harmony. Yeah. Um, and and so, so the aquifers were depleted, the, the waste materials were accumulating and bearing a burden on communities more so than on the industry itself. The very like Darwinian approach to looking at business (laughs) that most wouldn't see. So, so after all that like research and understanding what was going on, is there then a way to, to mitigate or reverse some of those effects or is it just kind of like you learn what you can and take it to the next place? Yeah. So, so I think one of my challenges and kind of it's like uh, I think this now informs the the work that I do now and how I work now mm-hmm. is that throughout my PhD work and, and I would say like my my early work the motivation and rationale and really kind of like the the point of view was that well we are researchers right we, we are trying to objectively understand what is happening in a particular place and not be judgmental and be very objective and kind of saying, okay, this is what's happening, using the data to tell the story, but not being too involved, right? And so we're going to produce some reports that, you know, they can then take and do whatever they want with it, right? <laughs> and usually that means it ends up on the shelf, it ends up in the garbage, yeah, <laughs> you know, and and so I would say that that now how I work is is very differently, right? Because I, I think the initiation of, of that project was essentially a professor proposing an idea and getting funding from either a government agency or a private donor you know, who's interested in supporting that work. The work that I've been doing in Chicago for the last kind of five, eight, several years, so so maybe since about like 2014, 2015, Mm -hmm. has been focused on using the tools within my repertoire to help support local businesses and local communities achieve the Uh, better understand kind of what's happening in their places and help them to achieve their aspirations. So 
it's taking a role of researcher as supporting that local drive and initiative versus researcher coming in with idea and you know kind of studying and imposing and i mean one of the things that we're talking a lot in about in universities now and especially universities in in north america is that we have been very extractive of knowledge, um, particularly in Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities, right? So we go in, we study, we see what's going on, we take that knowledge, we publish it, it helps us advance in our careers, but the report may or may not go back, and it isn't really like helping improve the lives of those people that we've studied. Right. Uh, And so I, I think, you know, that this perspective is something that that's really needed uh, more and more in the research community. And it's certainly something that that I am practicing in the work that I do now. So I've been working in Chicago in the food system. uh, So primarily with black, um, brown, Latine um, communities, understanding what their needs are and seeing how our tools can help support them. So one of the projects that I'm focused on now is looking at helping small local producers access contracts with large institutional buyers. So if we think about a small urban farm trying to sell to Chicago public schools, which is the third largest school district in the United States, and serves on the order of half a million meals per day. Per day, so, wow. Mm-hmm. And so, so that is a huge disparity in scale. Right. right. And so what we're looking at are cooperatively owned business models where small producers can work together to meet some of those supplies and working with the institutions to carve out places in their contracts that's going to be beneficial and advantageous for small producers to access, right? So uh, like this group of small producers, you know, won't be able to supply half a million meals per day, right? Right. But maybe they can provide um, all of the, one of my colleagues likes likes onions, maybe you might supply all of the onions needed for, you know, 30 schools on the south side of, of the city. Mm-hmm. And, and so we're trying to, to work to kind of figure out these business model innovations um, that can help uh, these small producers, disadvantaged producers access these contracts. So another um, one of the projects uh, well, that I'm working on. <laughs> I'm curious about that just really quickly. What does that look like on a on, I guess, a policy level? Because I would imagine that you would need some kind of a third party unless you're then becoming the third party to kind of make that sustainable to consistently be using or seeking these smaller farms where, you know, generally they're not needed or people overlook them. How do you, how do you make that work? Precisely right, Arlene, (laughs) because the policy, right. Uh So, you know, so in my bio, I talk about uh, transforming our social and ecological systems, right. And so we're like, like moving towards systems change towards sustainability. And systems change can be initiated on multiple levels, right? So you might typically have, you know, very innovative things happening at a niche level, Mm -hmm. right? So so we want to think about how, um, you know, somebody develops a new method for producing onions. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You have to like onions onions are like my, 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 most hated <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> so it's top of mind, naturally. <laughs> and so they might develop an innovation, but then how do you scale that, right? Mm-hmm. So you need financial capital. Uh, you need policy. So you need um, interventions at multiple levels, right? So we might think about this as a niche. And, and again, using my ecosystem analogy, right? So, so the niche level, the very small scale, you might have a community level and then a landscape, Right. And so this can be like our whole region, our whole island. So policy levels come in at that landscape level. Right. And, mm-hmm. and here in Chicago and in a number of other cities in the US, uh, the local governments have bought into something called the Good Food Purchasing Program. Okay. And the idea is that rather than it, it's 
getting institutions within those local governments to change their purchasing behavior and use the power of their purchasing to to promote a values-based procurement rather than a least cost procurement, right? So, So we want to supply food or obtain food that is has high nutritional value, is environmentally sustainable, practices good animal welfare, has fair labor practices, and supports local economic development. So those kind of five values are embedded in this good food purchasing program, GFPP. And so that sets the stage, right? And so because the mayor you know, kind of whoever in the local government has signed and said, this is something that we want to promote. The institutions, the schools, the hospitals, um, even the jails, right? Are like, oh, we have to follow this policy. And so what does this mean? So we have to change kind of who we purchase from, what we purchase and, and can try to figure out, okay, like what are the things that we can try to purchase more locally? from especially from uh, pre- historically disadvantaged producers. And so then not to get too deep into this, but then I'm guessing that would require some type of certifications or like verifications from these producers now to say like, yes, I check all these boxes before they can be selected. Yeah, yeah, precisely. So, so there are a number of certification schemes. And, you know, you can imagine that if you're a small producer, the cost of certification might be prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that that, uh, is being explored is having group certification, right? Uh, So so one of the the key certifications for um, agricultural products is called GAP. So it's good agricultural practices. And so we are exploring group gap certification to uh, sort of spread that cost across like several small producers. But yeah, so one of the things that that I did last year and um, working on getting this publication out was a kind of baseline survey of farmers in a 300 mile radius of Chicago. So the people who could potentially sell into this program to understand, do they have the certifications and what are the barriers that they face with respect to getting certified or to employing some of the practices that are related to these kind of five value areas. And so with that information from the survey, We've then used that to help inform the type of training uh, that can be provided to help support these local farmers to get those those contracts, right? So, So that certification was a piece of it. Another piece of it was networking, right? That they simply do not know. They don't move in the same circles as the institutional buyers, right? So setting up networking meetings, or call it a buyer supplier mixer. Um, so, so people can know, okay, well, you know, CPS produces or purchases um, how many pounds of apples <laughs> every month, right? Yeah. And I'm producing this much. So if, I, if they know me, you know, uh, yes. there can be an opportunity for, for making that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, so 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 the work is kind of um, in a way driven by what the the needs are, but then the research helps to identify. Okay, anecdotally, this is what you know five people have told us, but we just did the survey with two hundred people, and yes, you know eighty percent of them say that's the the number one barrier. So therefore, we're going to structure our training programs to address that need, right? Or something shows up that we weren't aware of. And it's like, oh, we didn't think of that. We didn't hear that from, you know, the the folks that that we're currently talking to. And so uh, we can introduce this new program to to meet that need. It's like figuring out what's out there and then validating what is or isn't an issue and then Mm -hmm. finding ways to connect people who need the connections. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I would say, you know, I'd add one other piece to that, and that ties in with a lot of the work that, that we do at the university, right? So 
you as a, a proud Illinois Tech alum, you know, know that we focus a lot on technology and entrepreneurship and really trying to, to build innovative solutions to existing problems, right? So we might say, oh, there's, there's a technology piece that's missing, right? Or, or there's lack of data or poor data transparency you know, mm-hmm. piece that is blocking. So I can put together a team of students to work on a particular project to try to develop an innovative solution to to that problem. I like it. Okay, so that was a lot. I think think one thing that I've taken from everything that we talked about so far is just that theme, STEM, you know, all of of those fields, it's never really one thing. Like you can Mm -hmm. say that you're a scientist or you're a geologist or you're an environmental um, scientist, whatever it is, but it's never just one field or one niche or one industry that you're involved with because there are so many different parts and pieces that feed into it. Like you're talking about taxes and finances and, you know, valuations and all this random stuff that like as a (laughs) business stuff. Yeah. And like, as a student, growing up we're kind of taught like well you have to pick one like you said you had to pick Mm -hmm. geography or chemistry you know but Mm -hmm. they all interconnect so it's it's good to hear you talk about the real life applications because at the end of the day that's that's what it is that's what it's about yeah and if I could just respond to that I mean I think that having a sense of what you want to work on and and, you know like whether it's something that you are passionate about or feel that you have a value that you can add in a particular space, uh, that there is not one way to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That there are multiple ways. Uh, You know, like I I, I have, well, in in Trinidad, and I don't know if this is the same um, in Grenada, you know, like we have the the high schools that are sort of the the semi-private religiously run and then there are the government secondary schools right and and, and so the the, on the surface perception is that well if you go to one of the what do we call them the Mm -hmm. (laughs) quasi-private um rather religious we call it government government assisted okay yeah is what we call them in trinidad yeah Um, similar here then you know, you're a cut above the rest of the folks who are just going to the government secondary schools, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we sort of like write off that, you know, if, if you're in a government secondary school, that you're not going to go to university or you're not, you know, um, that a particular career path is not open to you. Mm-hmm. And I think we really need to recognize that, that people um, grow at different rates right and whether it's intellectual emotional maturity that there 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 really are multiple ways that that we can help support kids to lead lives that that are um doing doing careers that are meaningful to them right uh and so you might start off in in science and like me end up in business and and so it, it's hard right now. Like sometimes, you know, like I'm looking on Twitter and I see kind of real scientists doing real science. And I'm like, Am I, can I still call myself a scientist, man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not mixing oh. things in test tubes, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I still do science, but I also do design and I also do management and that's okay. Right. Right. Because we need people who you know, we need people who can speak multiple languages. Right. And mm-hmm. so, so that's where I am right now as being this very interdisciplinary person who can speak just as easily to the engineers and understand the technical aspects of a problem and solution, as well as with the designers, right, who are thinking about the bigger picture and the strategy and the managers who want to know, okay, well, what's the return on this investment, right? How much money do you need? What am I going to get back? You know, what's the payback period? You know, what's the, uh, what is the internal rate of return, right? Right. And, And so, we need folks who can speak 
in that interdisciplinary way. But we also need folks who who are passionate about the engineering, right? And, yeah. and who are the ones who are going to develop that new technology solution, right? And, and know all of the, the specifics to um, understand what the problem is, what are the limitations of solutions and put that solution together. But it is in these interdisciplinary teams where we're going to have solutions that scale, right? And, and that can really speak to a broad audience. Agreed. I think I would ask you for a piece of advice, but I feel like there was some really good advice wrapped up in there. But is there anything you want to add to that as advice for, you know, younger students, listeners coming up who may be at that intersection of, I don't have a specific thing that I'm interested in, or, um, or maybe they, they have a, an interest, but they're not sure how to get there anything you would say to them? At, at, at the risk of, you know, giving bad advice, <laughs> <laughs> I think in, in some way you go through the doors that are open to you. And Sometimes that might not look like where you want to go, right? It, it might be the, the best option. Um, and at the moment, you know, it, it might not seem as though it's the right fit. But if you can make a connection, if you can see, um, try to think about the bigger picture, uh, and how this opportunity might help you get some knowledge, get um, some experience that could help you uh, further down the line, right? I mean, I, I feel like for me, in in hindsight, I could I can look back and say, oh yeah, like this circuitous path that that I've been on has led me to to where I am, right? And and there are many other places that I could have been. Right. right. Um, mm -hmm. But where I am today is the result of where I've been, the choices that I've made. And, you know, I am doing something that I care a lot about. I think it's very meaningful. I get a lot of professional satisfaction, but I could be doing other things. Right. And so at the beginning, you know, you and I were talking about kind of before we, we got on about what I'm doing in the Caribbean. And I'm like, I would love to be doing more work in the Caribbean, but I'm now, you know, located in the US Midwest in Chicago. And the, I'm like, feel like so deeply embedded in this work that I'm doing that sometimes it, it's hard to be like, okay, like I know there's applicability to things that are going on in the Caribbean, right? And if we talk about food systems, and here we're talking about food sovereignty, right? And I know you guys are talking about food sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. And how, we do, how do we reduce our dependence on, on imports, right? And, and kind of like give supports to local farmers, create more opportunities, more, more business opportunities. And so I know it's, it's applicable, right? But there are so many hours in a day, <laughs> um, yes. so much, much energy. And, you know, like I have two little kids who demand a lot of time. And so, so, so you put your energy, you know, where you get fulfillment, right? And, 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 and there, you know, maybe other options open to you. And, and if it feels right, you know, take it. But I think, you know, strategically and, and the big picture, there, there are some people who kind of have that drive, a particular goal, this is where I want to go. And, and some of us who kind of move more where the opportunity takes us. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's debate on, you know, which, which is a more successful That's life strategy. Right. But one can have a, a very fulfilling life either way. Right. And so I would say, you know, be gentle with yourself <laughs> and look at the opportunities that are open to you and maybe don't think not only about what looks good on paper, but 
what are the opportunities that help you to develop as a whole person and which provide you with a community that can really support you in that journey. And, and I think for me, you know, like the people that I have kind of worked with along the way and, you know, th- this conversation is very helpful for kind of reflecting on that, right? That there there were people along the way who were very instrumental in in my journey and being a support and creating a community that that was um, important for that journey. And, you know, you end up somewhere, (laughs) hopefully do something uh, interesting and fulfilling to you. Uh, And, and pay it forward, right? Like, mm-hmm. like look back and, and see how you too might be that type of person and support for others behind you. I don't, I don't think I could have said it any better, but I feel like I'm living through all of that that you just said. So <laughs> that's validating. But I think that's a perfect place to wrap it up and end it right there. I really appreciate your time again. It's been an interesting conversation and enlightening to, to kind of, cause it's, it's easy to look at, you know, people and where they are and be like, wow, you know, they're doing so much, but to understand how you got there, what steps you took, the steps backward that you might've taken along the way and, and just figuring it out day at, one day at a time. So thank you once again for joining us today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Arlene. I look forward to, uh, to, hearing more about the the podcast series and seeing, you know, how it develops and, and, and also your journey. All right. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And to the listeners, thank you for joining us on today's pathway. Keep listening. We'll be right back after a short break. This season of pathways is brought to you by Telesford countertop and general construction services, your number one source for quartz and solid surface. Their services are not only limited to countertops, Their team builds homes, cabinets, vanities, does 3D images, renovations, and quantity estimates. Telesford Countertop and General Construction Services mission statement is pride and delivery upon customer satisfaction. Contact them today at 435-0133 to get started on your construction project. So Anthony, uh, we're able to look at some of the footage from Dr. Ashton's interview. What are some of your initial thoughts? Well, I think Dr. Ashton is an amazing woman. I've been very inspirational, especially um, where she went to school and was able to explain that, okay, she's a smart lady. Um, Yes, sometimes you fall off, but then you could always get back on the ball and go and achieve greater things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's very inspirational though. Yeah. Yeah. Also, her story when she went for about her master's. Mm-hmm. I mean, okay, yeah, environmental science. And so I didn't think like that was basically what they do. But yeah, it's amazing to see, okay, this is what environmental science is about. Like basically the environment and so on. I'm basically helping businesses as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's like to your point about her. Um, kind of like refocusing herself after she realized that she was kind of slipping off the track a little bit. It's something good to see and that a lot of people don't do because she was able to not just realize that she wasn't doing as well as she wanted to do or as as well as she She. knew she could, um, but then being able to like put the right things in place to say, all right, I know if I want to get into school, I need a scholarship. What do I need to get a scholarship? So she knew she, she needed better grades. And then along her story, you can tell that she had that foresight into what steps she needed to take in order to achieve the next thing that she wanted. Yes, correct. Um, And it could be that a lot of that was in in hindsight, where she's now able to talk about, yeah, you know, I did this and I did this. Um, Sometimes when you're in it, you you don't really really know. But in hindsight, you'd be like, oh, this is what got me here. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and I'm grateful, grateful for this, that this happened and I realized, this. you know, if I didn't realize this, then I probably, I don't know, I'd probably be different right yeah. now. Yeah. So yeah, some of the, some of these things just happen for a reason. I mean, yeah, you need, sometimes you need to go through certain things, mm-hmm. you know, to get where you need to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And something else, I don't know if you um, heard this part when she was talking about 
the people that she came across in her life were very important in like directing her path. Because for instance, when she was getting into um, her PhD, the advisor that she met and spoke to was able to kind of give her some ideas about what she works on and that got her interested and piqued her interest and said, yeah, we could use things like that in the Caribbean. And so that's why she made the choice to pursue that thesis. Yeah, that just shows when you have like the correct mentorship and so on. Sometimes it's sink or swim, yeah? But you're not going to really sink. You always have this hand out to help you. Yeah, exactly. You know, and get, to, get where you need to go. And being okay with stepping out of your comfort zone maybe and talking to people. Because I think she had just reached out to this, yeah. this woman. And you never know. One thing I think is really important, and um, I have to keep telling myself this and also like tell other people in my life, is that the worst thing someone can tell you is no. Like... Well, I mean... Well, not the worst thing, but... <laughs> but if you're, like, if you're just asking for information, you just, like, reach out to someone to say, hey, I'd like to learn more about whatever it is that you do. Yeah. Really and truly, like, it's either yes or no. It's, yeah, it's yes or no. Yeah. yeah. So it never hurts just to put yourself out there and say, like, hey, I'd like to I'd learn like more to, about you. Yeah, I'd like to know more about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it helps, uh, helps everybody. I mean, yeah, the best thing to... Like, sometimes the best way to know what you're doing is actually to teach. True. You know? True. Yeah, so yeah, if you can't teach, like I heard like somebody said this, if you can't explain it to a young child, then you probably don't know it as, as well as you know. That's true, yeah. that's true, yeah. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, what she had mentioned closer to the end of the discussion. So she had talked a lot about, you know, the idea of not necessarily following a singular path like there's many different ways to get to what you want to do or to achieve you know whatever it is you want to achieve in life so the idea of like her being a scientist quote unquote but then she also finds herself in lots of different parts of like lots of different industries where she has to kind of be able to understand the business side of things and speak to the engineers talk about the more technical things and you you have those types of people in life you have the ones who are more interdisciplinary and then you have the ones that are very specialized and can speak to one thing but they're experts on it and they're the ones who will go on to you know develop new cures for cancer and all that stuff well yeah i think like as you grow you figure out um like your path is not set in stone like mm -hmm. as you grow everything like it diverges and so on like you're not the same person you were like maybe a year ago with um, the information that you get and so on. Yeah. So yeah, so maybe you might, a year ago you might think, all right, this is where I want to go. And then something happens and then you'd be like, maybe no, I, I think, okay, maybe I should go this direction, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's, it's set off from the path that you initially chose, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and also I see like, okay, her being like a middle person, I mean, she's she's very smart. She dabbled in uh, different um, subjects, mm -hmm. you know. So basically, she's um, kind of the best person, basically, to be like the middle person, because she has like like an understanding. She wouldn't be in debt, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, she. But she knows has, what's needed. Yeah, she uh, yeah, she could basically translate. Okay, this is what this is what he's saying, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, see, like, this scientist might be talking about all this kind of technical terms, you know, and then basically this business guy. I mean, I don't know about the science, you know, I know about business. Yeah. And she's yeah. just the mediator between them. Okay, translating, okay, cool. All right. And yeah, and that's basically, that's how work gets done, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm in project management and that's like what project managers, managers do. They translate Trans between yeah. all these different stakeholders. But it's a very important task because generally speaking, like, so let's say in construction industry, you have architects and you have engineers the civil engineers who uh -huh. generally hate each other because <laughs> they yeah, can never see eye to eye <laughs> on know, anything right but then you have like the the contractor or the middle person the project manager who can come in you know they understand the design side of things they understand what's needed to actually make the construction work like in the field what actually works versus what doesn't and they're able to bring these people into a room and say well, okay how do we meet middle on middle ground mm -hmm. right um, so yeah, it's like an important aspect that is often missing from like lots of different industries who yeah. want to focus. I'm, t I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you, and basically there's this... But we're not talking to each other. We're not talking <laughs> to each other, you know, there's yeah. a disconnect, mm -hmm. you know, so you need that's this person in the middle. Yeah. To connect. Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, I think like in computer science, we have a, we have this person called a dev, DevOps, the project manager, basically. Yeah. And so, okay, while the guys inside coding and so on, mm -hmm. the, the the project manager is basically talking to the clients. Okay, this is how things are going. You know, mm -hmm. putting it in a in a and like in a the, language that they could understand. Right. You so know? saying like, this is what you want. This is the end product yeah. you're looking for, and mm -hmm. this is what we're yeah. going to do to get you there. Yeah, and this is how long it's going to. It's probably going to take. You know. Yeah. 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 And they explain, okay, this is why it's going to take this long. Exactly. Why is it taking so long? This is why it's going to take so you long. You have to keep everyone satisfied. <laughs> yeah, keep everyone satisfied. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we need we need some some people like that. You know. Agreed. Mm -hmm. So what about? Um, kind of the, the bulk of what she does, which is the industrial ecology, I think is a pretty interesting um, field of work that she does that isn't really focused on in the Caribbean or in yeah. Jamaica. I was actually surprised with that, that kind of job. I, I always thought like, I didn't really look into environmental engineering, yeah. you know, but as she explained, okay, this is what she actually does. I mean, I think I got a, a better appreciation for the for the field, mm -hmm. you know, and also yeah, and I think like maybe if I if I got to introduce there, I might have probably cho chose yeah. that field, you know, but yeah, it's just like sometimes there's no there's nobody um, explaining it to you, like mm -hmm. you don't have anybody there. So I know it's not your field, but what do you think about how the food industry in Grenada works right now? Like, what do you know about it even? I think there's a lot of people like in culinary doing doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the pandemic basically highlighted that. And I think like basically production wise, I know like we're looking into trying to get um, sustainability. I know that some companies, they went away from using like styrofoam and so on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's um, I think it's important yeah. that we look into those things. Especially being an island that we are, I mean, and it damages the stuff that we use to project, like, like maybe distribute yeah. causes. And I mean, looking at like current affairs, there's a shortage, like food shortage. In Gre not a, not yet, maybe, but in terms of wheat production and so on that we oh usually get yes. from Europe. Yeah, that's. That, so the idea of like learning how to sustain ourselves and kind of making these linkages in the food ecosystem and figuring out okay well where can we get these supplies from or how can we as different yeah. caribbean islands come together or try, to yeah. supply ourselves rather than having to look outside yeah and i think i think yeah i think we kind of need somebody like that to yeah. basically coordinate with the whole caribbean mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. because yeah the caribbean i've always said this the caribbean could actually be like one huge state inter on, on each other. But we talk a lot about, a lot in the Caribbean, a lot in Grenada, about not having industries to get into. So people who might be interested in, you know, chemical engineering will be like, well, there's nothing here for me. But I feel like there's so much that can be developed and there's no one focusing on how to develop things here locally, right? So for instance, what we're talking about with the food ecosystems and figuring out how to make that work like i don't know maybe it exists but i don't know of a organization uh, that yeah, exists, exists to do that to do it. yeah yeah but it's very much needed yeah it's needed so but, we, i mean someone can someone create needs to needs to industry. do it and mm -hmm. actually highlight that they are doing it yeah 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 that's a wrap on today's episode and to you the watchers Thank you for joining us on today's Pathway. Thanks so much for listening. We would absolutely appreciate your comments and feedback as we try to make this podcast more beneficial for you, our listeners and watchers. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please take a minute to press the review button, let us know how we're doing, and let others know that this is something that's worth their time. We also love to see your comments and engagement on social media, so head over to the post and let us know what you think about this latest episode.